Hey guys, I spent the last 28 days with a continuous glucose monitor in my arm and I'm going to share some insights that have made quite a big impact on the way that I eat. For anyone new to my channel, I'm Fraser. I've been making videos for about 10 years now and I like to do a lot of self-experimentation. I've done a previous video on blood glucose where I was using the finger prick tests. I was doing that every half an hour after a meal and graphing the results. To pinch a clip directly from that video. What we measured is our postprandial glucose response. Postprandial just means during or after eating. So we want to see how our blood sugar rises and falls based on different foods. A healthy response is after the rise for it to come down below 7.8 after two hours. So my initial interest in glucose monitoring was the individual variation you can see when different people eat exactly the same meal. But as you'll see, that's only going to be one piece of the puzzle. I've been wanting to get hold of a CGM for a while now. I found a company based in the UK called Very, and for about £100 with a discount code, I was able to get two sensors, each lasting 14 days, as well as access to their app. The sensor is placed on the back of the arm. My only recommendation is for side sleepers to put it on the arm that you don't sleep on. There's an alcohol wipe to clean the area. You then let it air dry. Do let it dry. My friend's sensor fell off straight away because his arm was a bit wet. Unscrew the applicator, line it up with the mark on the other part of it. Press down firmly and you should see the needle. There's then another firm press to apply it to your arm. The advertised pain rating for application is a 1 out of 10, and I completely agree. I don't know how this hurts less than a finger prick, but I barely felt it. There's then a protective patch, which I found very helpful for my paranoia about brushing against something and pulling it out. Speaking of pulling it out, I thought it was solid like a drawing pin, but it's uh, flexible and you can peel it like a regular plaster without much discomfort. It takes a while to calibrate, so the recommendation is to apply it in the evening. That way those first few hours where it's not as accurate are happening while you're sleeping. You then have to set up the app. The sensor is an Abbott Freestyle Libra, and I then needed to set up another app called Libra View to pull through the data. The CGM reads your glucose every five minutes and it stores that information in the sensor. So you have to scan it at least every eight hours to transfer that data to the phone, uh, though you're of course welcome to do it more frequently. The eight hour window is a little inconvenient at night. Even if I scan it as I get into bed, it can be more than eight hours to fall asleep and be asleep. So you get these little gaps in the data appearing late evening. The main focus though is on meal times. You add the details about the meal and two hours later you scan again to get a meal score out of 10. This relates to how aggressively your blood glucose spiked and fell and the more stable your glucose response, the higher your score. To give you a feel for it, I'm going to walk you through my second full day wearing the CGM. So it started with a waking up at 6.30. I then had breakfast at 7.15. This was one and a half scoops of vegan protein blended with a banana, 100 grams of oats made with water, and 10 grams of dark chocolate on top. From a 5.8, my glucose rose to 7.9 within an hour, then dropped to 5.0 half an hour later, before rising again to 6.7. At 12.30, I did a half hour calisthenics workout, mainly pull-ups. 1 p.m. was lunch, 100 grams of couscous, 200 grams of beef, a bell pepper, and a few tablespoons of olive oil. My glucose started at 5.4, rose to 8.5 in around 45 minutes, then back down to 5.8. At 4 p.m., a snack, rice cake with 20 grams of peanut butter. There's some movement here, but it scores a 9 out of 10, mainly because there's not enough carbohydrate or protein in the meal to elicit an effect. Dinner at 6 p.m., a till of mackerel, 100 grams of white rice and sweet corn, producing two small waves, a 6.4 and a 6.8, with this meal scoring 8 out of 10. This was a very typical day for me. It was a weekday, so I was working from home, sitting at my desk from 9 a.m. to 12.30, then 1.30 until 5. After dinner, I'm with my daughters, and that includes the bath and bedtime routine. The graph in the Libra view is also quite nice for showing daily glucose patterns. So this is my data across the 28 days. I'll dig into this graph a little more when I cover my results. Regarding the protocol, when you first order a CGM, they recommend you split the 28 days as follows. So it's the first seven days you just eat normally. The next 14 days you start experimenting with variations. And then the final seven days is for optimization. Uh, but for me personally, I was already experimenting on day three. Having eaten the same breakfast twice, I wanted to start making changes. If you really sit down and consider the variables that could impact your blood glucose, then you need a lot of experimentation. If you take my breakfast, I normally eat the same thing every day. 
But in the first two weeks, I tried removing things, swapping things, adding things. I tried some of the blood glucose hacks and I changed portion sizes. All that is for just one meal, so you can imagine how long it would take to collect really comprehensive data on yourself. Factor in that you should also try and eat each meal at least twice in case other variables have influenced your meal score, which happened to me a few times. Um, so 28 days is really not a lot of time. So onto my results. First things first, my fasted glucose. Typically a fasted reading will be taken at least eight hours after your last meal. When I did this a few years ago with the finger prick method, I was getting an average of 4.6 millimoles per litre. For the 28 days I wore the CGM, my fasted glucose before breakfast averaged 5.5. On this graph, you can also see the changes I made had a positive impact with my second two weeks averaging 0.2 lower. At the halfway point, I tried to be a bit more organised. I was looking through for ingredients that I typically eat a lot of, but had only eaten once or twice, things like sweet potato and I made an effort to include them a few more times in the second 14 days. After the second sensor had finished, I had another look through my data. So taking the average meal scores containing certain ingredients, fatty foods like peanut butter, egg, and cheese came out on top, and my typical post-workout foods like beef, white rice, and olive oil were down the bottom. I was generally quite sensible across the 28 days, so I didn't get round to deliberately spiking my glucose with sugary treats. A lot of these individual ingredients only ranked high or low because of their association with other foods. For example, strawberry jam scored really highly for me, and that's only because it's my topping of choice when I eat full fat Greek yogurt. With very at least, there was no way to enter portion sizes, which I think is a major variable that's overlooked. Uh, when I was eating my post-workout meals, they typically contain a lot of starchy carbohydrate, and that's obviously going to affect my meal score. The pattern I really noticed, other than meal composition, was how my activity levels influenced my glucose. Going back to that graph where you can see my average for the 28 days, there are two areas with a lot of variation. The first is between 7 and 9 a.m. and the second is around 2 p.m., while after dinner is surprisingly stable. Exactly half of those mornings I look after my daughters and I'm generally active, getting up and down off the floor, chasing them around. Then the other half I have time to myself, which is typically spent sitting down either with my laptop or reading a book. The second area is around 2 p.m. On weekdays, I'm eating, then immediately sitting back down to work. And on weekends, I might have just exercised, which can also increase glucose. I believe the evening is stable because every day I'm playing with my girls, then taking them through a bedtime routine. I've heard other CGM users say that a 10 minute walk after a meal is practically magic in the way that it can blunt a blood glucose response. And in my experience, I've seen a similar effect from other low level activities like housework or parenting. I've also been reflecting on the fact that my fasted glucose has risen in the last few years, and I can think of several reasons why. Firstly, I've been doing less lower body weights. These are the big muscle groups that can help uh, increase demand for glucose and draw it out of the bloodstream. I spent a lot of time doing vertical jumping and then sprinting, and I haven't consistently trained my legs with heavy compound lifts like squats, the way I used to when I was younger. At the same time, I haven't changed my eating habits. My meal staple is a 100 gram serving of starchy carbohydrate, whether that's oats, rice, pasta, buckwheat, or couscous. So I'm eating to support an exercise regime that I no longer follow. Changes in low intensity activity have counted for a lot as well. Working from home during the pandemic meant I lost that 15 to 20 minute walk straight after breakfast when I go to catch my train which I now know was perfectly timed to blunt the glucose response from eating my oats. What it's been replaced by is a 20 second trudge upstairs to my study, uh, where I'll then sit for three or four hours of sedentary chair dwelling until lunch. Finally, grazing. My daughters have turned two this month and whether it's finding pockets of time to eat a quick snack or eating their leftovers, I'm constantly bombarding my body with these little hits of glucose. Ideally, you would have long, uninterrupted periods where your body isn't dealing with food, but that just doesn't happen anymore. So what have I learned? I actually have a video on insulin sensitivity and a lot of that still holds true. So firstly, walking after meals or any kind of low level activity can work really well. You don't want it to be very intense, but if it's housework or tidying up, anything is better than the common behavior of sitting down and not getting up again for several hours. Secondly, food ordering. Uh, this is a way to eat exactly the same food and change your glucose response by eating it in a different order. The ideal order is for veggies to be first, then fats and proteins, and starchy carbohydrates last. 
You don't need to deconstruct every meal, but when you see the opportunity, take it. I often snack when I'm preparing lunch or dinner, and I now make that snack a fibrous vegetable. Next, uh, cinnamon helps, as does apple cider vinegar. I was diluting the apple cider vinegar one part to five with water and drinking it through a straw to protect the enamel on my teeth. The research shows up to a 30% reduction in the glucose peak of the following meal. Cinnamon is a half teaspoon with my protein shake and it has a similar effect. Lastly, adding fats. Having four grams of fat for every 10 grams of carbohydrate is the ratio that's been shown to reduce the rise in blood glucose. Obviously, adding fats means adding calories and not all fats are healthy. So it's important to remember that blood glucose response isn't everything. You don't want to find yourself ignoring the nutrient content of a meal or overall calories in a day in order to chase some perfect straight line. It's very much about considering everything about a meal, not just its impact on your blood glucose when it comes to choosing what to eat. Thank you for watching.